Welcome Life Sciences, welcome to another exciting Life Science lesson. Life Science is always exciting and that's why I'm always going to start off with saying that. So what are we looking at today? We're still busy with the human excretory system and the last couple of segments that we've looked at, we've looked at what right, the human excretory system is, the urinary system, all the organs that are involved, we look at what the kidney right, looks like and then we looked at this, this nephron, this tiny, tiny little structure in the kidneys that literally does all the work. And we looked at how the kidneys take all of our blood and they filter it and they take out what we still need and they get rid of everything that we don't need and that was called urine. Now today we're looking at quite an important concept about homeostasis. Now usually we put some kind of little, right, have you heard in, like, quite an exciting little quote. Today I've actually put a quote in, I've put a balance, um, a, a little picture in here. And homeostasis is all about balance. And that is really, really important. Certain things in your body, right, or most things in your body, have to be balanced. And if they are balanced, your body is going to work much better. So that's what we're going to look at in the next couple of segments. How do your kidneys, right? You looked at a lot of homeostasis when you did the digestive system. You looked at how insulin, right, how we get around a balance. When you looked at the gaseous exchange system, you looked at how oxygen and carbon dioxide, how we get a balance. And today we're going to look at how the kidneys, right, ensure certain things are balanced. Once again, when we look at all these concepts, what are we going to look at? We're going to look at this thing called homeostasis. And the things that we're going to concentrate on, how do the kidneys control our pH in our blood? How do they control the water? How they can control salt? And that's particularly what we're going to look at in this section. As usual, there are these words that you might be unfamiliar with. When we go through the lesson, once again, listen, how do we use them? How, what terms are they? If we don't understand, always go back to our textbook or our notes. As I said, they can be quite unfamiliar to us, then we do need to know what those terms mean. We need to understand life science, the language of life science. All right, now a lot of the slides you might see, I might have this concept of a seesaw, and that is really what this concept is about, is trying to find the right balance. And what we mean is, sometimes something goes up, then we need to bring it down, or something goes down and we need to bring it up. That's the concept that we're looking at here. Now, when we talk about the homeostasis, we refer to the environment. And what does this environment mean? We have looked at this concept before about what the environment is. And these are the environment that the cells find them in. You will see here, it's the word interstitial fluid. And it's all this blue liquid, right, that surrounds the cell. And this is, it's a really important concept within the body, this balance. What do we mean must be balanced? So when we talk about the environment, it's the environment that the cells find themselves in. And it's this interstitial, sometimes we call it intracellular, it's this fluid that must be balanced. And what do we mean? As I said to you before, it must have the right amount of glucose. It must maybe have the right amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide. It must have the right temperature. Now, all of that is in certain um, parts or components that we're going to look at later. But what we're going to concentrate on with the kidneys, what role do the kidneys play? They're going to control the amount of water. They're going to control the amount of salt, and they're going to have a control over the pH, right, the acid or alkalinity of these interstitial.
interstitial cells. Now, we could be looking at homeostasis, what's in between the cells, and that also implies the blood, right? What is the blood carrying? Because the blood's going to tell us, right, what we need to balance or not. So we're going to concentrate on these three parts. And the kidney is going to play a huge role in the balancing of those water, the salt, and the pH. Now guys, when we talk about pH, you don't need to understand the science here. So if you're not a science person, don't worry too much about it. Just understand one thing, right? That hydrogen can affect the pH of something. Now, what I mean by pH, I'm going to put the next slide on. The pH um, implies to whether something, we give something, all right, whether it's acidic or whether it is alkaline. Now, if you were to think of, have a look at the things here, if I was to ask you to taste vinegar, to drink vinegar, it might have a very different taste than maybe if I asked you to drink milk, right? Two very different tastes. And the reason behind this, I'm going back again, is this hydrogen, right? That hydrogen ions, the amount of hydrogen in something can have effect on the pH. And here particularly, the more hydrogen we have, right, the greater the acidity of something. So if I go back to this slide over here, we're going to look more at the scale. Now, if we have a look at pH, when we look at pH, I want you to think of one thing must come to mind, and that is enzymes. When you looked at biochemistry in one of the segments that you might have looked along throughout the years, Right, some of you I know can't remember, and I bring up biochemistry, my classes are like, oh dear, no. When we look at the concept of pH, enzymes, right, control how our body works. Enzymes were also proteins. And what did we learn very specifically? Enzymes are pH specific. And what does that mean? They will only work in a specific pH. So if we change the pH of anything, maybe here, if we change the pH of our blood, what will happen? The enzymes in our blood cannot work right properly. So if we have a look at this concept, while our body is during its normal metabolic activities, okay, what happens? Large numbers of hydrogen ions are produced, right? So we've got lots of hydrogen, and when we've got lots of hydrogen, what could the result be? Acidity, right? And if our internal environment is not balanced, if the pH is not right, what can happen? The body cannot function properly. So who's going to step in? We're going to have a look now. So we can do two things, all right? So what happens when our pH either goes too high or it goes too low? Remember, we are on a, a balancing, on a seesaw. We want things to be equal. Well, when we have too little hydrogen, what could happen is we can get other elements. For example, um, sometimes carbonate, all right? joins with the hydrogen to make something more alkaline. Okay, but where do the kidneys come in? If we have too much hydrogen, all right, what do we need to do? We need to release hydrogen. Now let's go back to our, all right, our kidney. And what we have, can you remember? Tubular excretion. What happens when, over here, I'm going to go to the red. What happens if we have too much acid, too many hydrogens? What can happen? Tubular excretion. We need to release hydrogen. And where do we do it? We take it out of the blood, we put it into the tubules, and we can excrete. 
And so doing, what do we do? What do the kidneys do? All right, when it gets too much, when it can get too acidic, the kidneys are going to bring it back to normal. They're going to get rid of the hydrogen during tubular excretion. And what are we going to have? Our balance is going to be back again. Have a look here. So we can see here we've got hydrogen in our blood. And what do they do? They pass through the walls of the tubules and out they go in urine as a waste product and everything is back to normal. Okay, guys, that's it for now. We're going to need a short little wee, back, wee break. We're going to be back right after this. Welcome back, Life Sciences. I hope you had a wee break. We're going to have to stop with the wee break when we look at a different section, but it's fun while it lasts. What are we looking at? We are looking at this concept of homeostasis. Things need to be balanced. And the last segment, we looked at this concept of how our kidneys are able to balance or regulate the pH in our body. And so doing so, right, make sure that things work well. And what was the pH? It was the hydrogen, right? So if our body became too acidic during, in the kidneys, in the tubules, we could, right, secrete or excrete the hydrogen into the tubules and we could excrete it out, therefore, right, balancing the pH in our blood, all right, in our interstitial fluids in our body. Okay, the next segment that we're going to look at has got quite a lot of terminology, quite a few new words. I think, as you can have a look behind me, quite a lot of new words on the board. Um, it might look a little bit frightening, but we're going to go through it. And once again, listen to how I use the words. And if you're not sure, always go over the notes or your textbook so that you're able to understand this com the, com um, the terms. The first term is a really big term. <laughs> I know it doesn't sound like it, but it's, it's quite an important term when it comes to the kidneys. And that is the word osmoregulation. And very often when we look at osmo, if I do that, I think a lot of you will think about osmosis. And in that concept, you are going to be correct. Because what it is, is it regulates osmoregulation is where we balance our water, right? And usually when I say solutes, very often it is about the salt, right? Or it could be about the glucose content in our body, right? The glucose content. What is osmosis? I'm not quite sure if you can remember, but it's the movement of water from a high concentration from, okay, high concentration to a low concentration. And remember, what did you have to do? You had to go through a cell membrane. So it wasn't diffusion, all right, and it's very often how a lot of, right, organisms are able to move things around the body. Guys, it's very important. Our water balance in our body has to be regulated. Why? I'm sure you can all think about a time, especially, uh, especially this first one, when you have had too little water, when you are thirsty, right, and all you want to do is have something to drink. And what happens is you become dehydrated. And some of you might have a headache, right, when we become dehydrated, we might have a headache, we might be dizzy, we might feel like we want to be sick, we want to vomit, Right, so when we are dehydrated, our body right, is, it tells us that things are not right. And believe it or not, guys, we can actually have too much water. Sometimes the, sim the symptoms can be very similar to that. And if we have a look at it, imagine we have an animal cell. And if we have water move in, right, what happens is that cell membrane is going to burst 
because unlike plant cells, we don't have a cell wall right, that's going to be able to contain that water. So when we look at our seesaw over there, our balance is really important that it's, we don't have too little water and we don't have too much. We've got to get the balance right. Now, when we look at this concentration, there's a word here, this balance, is that when we have solute, when we have things dissolved in our water, in the water, right? And what do I mean by water? Two things. Blood is made up of water. And remember, our interstitial fluid, or our fluid in between our cells, that is water, which means that that can have an influence. The greater the concentration of solute, let's imagine I've got two beakers over here, and I put water in each of them, and in this beaker, I put one teaspoon of salt, and imagine in this beaker, I put 10 teaspoons of salt. So here I'm going to have a little bit of salt, a little bit of solute, and here I'm going to have a lot of solute. And guys, that has a huge impact, right, on how water is going to move. Let me explain to you what I mean. Okay, so say for example, here is your blood vessel over here. And you guys eat a lot of salt, right? A lot of salt. Check your food labels. Lots and lots of foods have salt, right? So here we've got, in your blood, we've got a lot of salt. Here is water surrounding the blood. Where does water move? Water moves from a high concentration to a low concentration. So water moves out of the interstitial fluid. So what happens to these cells over here? They are dehydrated, right? They lack water, so that is a problem. But when I put the water into my blood, what is happening? The water fills my blood vessels. And we all say, cool, water is filling our blood vessels. Uh -uh. When water goes into our blood vessels, guys, that's called blood pressure, okay? Filling it. So when we have a lot of salt in our diet, huh? so what happens? The water from our cells, interstitial, moves into my blood. My blood vessels are filled with fluid, and now they're under high blood pressure. And what does high blood pressure do? Right, I can have a stroke, I can have a heart attack. It could actually kill me. That is what osmolarity is. If I change what's dissolved in my blood or my cells, I change how water moves around. Okay, so if we have a look at like this, so what happens is, okay, so imagine now you don't have the water that you need. Remember, this is the nephron. These guys, this is called the loop of Henle. Loop of Henle is going to have a role right in the water. So say for example, I don't really have that as much water, or let me go nephron, as I needed that day. Look what the loop of Henle does. It pumps out sodium, all right? So it pumps out salt. I'm gonna write here, salt. Now imagine you guys to eat salt and vinegar chips, or lack of slop chips with vinegar. What happens, what do you feel? thirsty. So what always follows salt? High concentration, low concentration, what follows? Water. Okay, where does this water go? This water goes into your blood. There's blood vessels around here, all right? You didn't have enough water for that day and your body says, hey dude, all right, you didn't have enough water, but don't worry, the kidneys have got it under control. So what happens? You've got less water in your urine because you drank less. Okay, but sometimes things just go out of control. I want you to picture it. It's a really hot day. You haven't had anything to drink. You're sweating, right? 
your body needs to have a system that can bring about the change. And this is where a hormone comes in. It's called ADH, or antidiuretic hormone. And guys, what it is here, you have a little pituitary gland, right? It's an endocrine gland. That's an endocrine, right? It's a hormone. And what triggers it is part of your brain, okay? So you're really hot, you're really sweating, and have a look at this picture over here. Look at this guy, okay? He's hot, he's sweating, and he's losing all this water. Check the sweat just running off. So when the blood goes past his brain, right over here, there's got what we call osmoreceptors. It's in the brain. And it says to this guy, all right, listen here, dude, two things. Number one, the brain, the hypothalamus, the thirst center, says to this guy, drink water. You need water. I'm making you thirsty. Drink. It also sends this hormone, right, over here, ADH, and this hormone goes to the collecting tubules. Now, guys, these collecting cube tubules are solid. They do not open, right? No water must go out of there. But this ADH, right, it controls these, and it says to these guys, all right, open up. Uh -uh. I need water. There's a problem here. All right, I need water. And what has happened here? There's salt. What is your loop of Henley doing? It's actually pump, actively pumping salt out. So where's their water? High concentration of water in my tubules, a low concentration in the medulla of my kidney. Where does water move? Water will move from a high concentration to a low concentration out of my urine. So I'm going to have less water in my urine. Okay, so guys, what this happens, this is a homeostatic control, really important. The hypothalamus is going to tell me, hey, I need to drink water, and I'm going to have this hormone, ADH, that's going to make these collecting tubules open and I take water out. And obviously then I have a far more higher concentration of urine. What are we looking at? We're looking at this concept of homeostasis. It's really, really important that certain right, elements in our body need to be kept constant. So our body needs to have this balance. We need certain things. If something goes up, we need to bring it down again. And maybe if it lowers, we need to bring it back up. We need to bring it into balance. And that's the concept that we have been looking at. All right, there are a few words, as I said to you each time on the board, that we have to look at. New words, new terms, new vocabulary. Please make sure that you go through them and that you understand what the terms mean. Right, we're looking at this concept of homeostasis, and in the last segment, we looked at how our kidneys regulate the pH, and we looked at how our body, in doing its normal things, releases a lot of hydrogen, and that has an effect on how acidic our body be can become. And because enzymes are very specific to enzyme to pH, we've got to make sure that our balance is right. And our kidneys doing that, right, if we get too much hydrogen by releasing them. We also looked at the concept of, right, osmoregulation. How do we control water? And that was very often by a hormone called ADH and a br part of our brain called our hypothalamus that together, all right, brought about us feeling thirsty, wanting to drink water, getting water back into our body, and also the kidneys. If we lack water, we can't excrete the water. The urine, we're wasting. So how does the kidneys, all right, absorb a lot of that water to stop us from dehydrating? Today, we're going to look at how our kidneys are going to control salt, right? Very important. All right, part of how that is going to occur. 
Now, if we have a look at the diagram over here, very often when we gave you a diagram of the kidneys, we would just draw the kidney looking like that. But that's actually not what the kidneys are totally all about. I want you to have a look at this structure. Right on the top of each of the kidneys is a endocrine gland. And what an endocrine gland is, is a gland that is going to secrete endocrine, right? It's going to secrete hormones. Now, hormones in the body are tied up with right, how our body controls things and keeps us in the balance. Now, if we have a look inside these all right, glands, we're going to see it's made up of all right, two parts. And we, when we look at it, you're going to see later when you look at the endocrine system that there are two hormones that are released. But we are paying very much um, tribute to only one of those organs. I'm sure you can guess what the other one will be. These are called the adrenal glands. Okay, guys, let me write it over here for you. I think I can find space. Adrenal gland, and I'm sure you're right. Yes, it secretes adrenaline, right, our fight or flight one. But we're very much interested in this second hormone, right? It's called aldosterone, and it, and it balances our salt. Look how close it is to the kidney, right? Very close to the kidney. Now, when it comes to salt, the kidney, I'm afraid, when it balances the salt, it unfortunately doesn't balance when we eat too much salt, right? So unfortunately, as I explained in the segment before here, Having too much salt, the kidney actually doesn't get rid of that salt. And that's why it's really bad for us. Remember in the last segment, I think you might have remembered when I said when we have a lot of salt in our diet, our kidney is actually not going to get rid of the salt. It's actually not so much of a too much. It's going to help us when we have too little. So if we have a lot of salt in our diet, what happens? Right, water moves from a high concentration to a low concentration, moves into the blood, the blood vessels fill out, and what do we have? High blood pressure, because the water's made this huge big pressure in our bodies, and that obviously makes us more at risk to strokes, to heart failure, to heart attack, to a thrombosis. And it's unfortunate though, but our kidneys, don't get rid of the extra salt. Our body keeps it. However, what our kidney is going to do is when we have too little salt, right? Then it's going to make a different plan. So if we have a look, remember we've got how the nephron works. We looked at this glomerular filtration. We looked at tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion. And when we look at salt, when we have too little salt, what is going to happen is our body needs to reabsorb. So if we have a look at tubular reabsorption, salt is obviously one of the things that we are going to reabsorb. So guys, what happens is, is that the hormone aldosterone, right, hormone aldosterone, when we have too little salt, the hormone is going to be secreted. Now, let's have a look what happens when we have too little salt. So, imagine it's here in my blood, right? And now I said to you, this is, like I'm contradicting myself. Too much salt is bad for me, but also too little salt can also be bad for me. So, this is why it's important that I have this balance. All right, so what will happen here? If I have too little salt, right, in my body, where does the water move? Aha, the water moves out of the blood. So what happens is, what happens to the blood levels, right, they drop, okay? So they drop in osmolarity. So my blood levels drop, that's not good. Also what happens is, my blood volume is low, because what is happening? Water is moving out of the blood, and I don't want it to move out the blood. 
So what happens, it creates a really low blood pressure. So what aldosterone is going to do is, aldosterone right, causes the salt. So where's the salt going to happen? Here in my sodium pump. All right, and here during my tubular reabsorption. What happens, sodium is actively pumped out aldosterone. So instead of it just happening normal, normally, aldosterone says to the tubules, pump out the sodium, right? So actively, and remember, what is surrounding all of that is the blood. So because our blood levels are low, the sodium doesn't actually go into the kidney, but it goes into the blood of the kidney. And what happens? What increases, right, increases, my salt concentration increases, which means my blood pressure increases, as does, right, the volume in my blood. It sounds to me a little bit weird that high blood pressure is going to cause me to come ill, but my body doesn't do anything about it. But when it comes to low salt concentration, my body is going to do this homeostatic process. It's one of those questions, we're not quite sure why. Why would it, all right, do something and then not the other thing? But that's not for us to question. Right, that is all for now. We're going to take a wee break and we'll be right back. back life sciences from your wee break I think it's almost the last time I'm allowed to say that hope we stretched right got everything ready right we're looking at this concept of excretion and what have we done so far because this is going to be the last segment that we're looking at we looked at the excretory system what excretion means it means to get rid of waste products specifically metabolic wastes we looked at how we need to get rid of all right, certain ways, products, when we sweat, we get a bit of water, when we breathe out, carbon dioxide, and especially the kidneys, and they had to get rid of this nitrogenous waste. They need to filter the waste out of the body. Now, that brings us to today's lesson. What happens when our kidneys no longer work, right, or when our kidneys fail us? What happens when that happens, the filtering is not going to occur. Okay, just a few concepts that we're going to look at that might that you might need to look at. So, what are we going to? What what are our options when our kidneys, all right, do fail? Now, guys, when we look at that, when we look at um, kidney failure, we always remember that we have two kidneys. So if we should damage the one kidney, the other kidney will be able to take over the work and it will function normally. But usually when we talk about kidney failure, we're talking about both our kidneys not working and our body not being able to filter. So if we have a look what kidney failure is, very obviously our kidneys no longer work properly, right? And that is going to be important because this is going to accumulate. So a lot of wastes, right, in our body, all those nitrogenous wastes, that urea, that ureic acid, that creatinine, that can turn poisonous in our body, we're not getting rid of. Also, we need to get rid of water and salt, right? That was important when we looked at that concept called osmoregulation, where we, the water and salt concentration was really important. So what happens is when water and salts accumulate, basically our blood pressure goes up and we have a lot of this fluid inside our body. And unfortunately what that does could put a lot of strain on our heart and ultimately our heart can obviously give in. We can have a heart attack or the heart, it fails as well. It doesn't work due to this accumulation. Okay, so what can cause kidney failure? 
right? There are a few things that can cause it. There can be a few triggers. The first one we're looking at is a bacterial infection. Now, sometimes a lot of us can get bacterial infections. So bacteria, there's a specific bacteria that obviously attacks the kidneys. And what it does is it attacks the tissues of the kidney. So if the kidney tissues are attacked to such a large extent that the kidney tissues are damaged, the kidney is no longer going to work. So unfortunately, bacterial infections, we don't know how we get them. It might be a simple urinary tract infection that might change, but what can happen is a bacterial infection could damage it. Right, number two, um, very often we actually don't use painkillers properly. Um, we use too much or we use it too often. And as I said, what it does is, all right, the, the kidney needs to pump all of these different um, poisons, drugs. Remember I said to you that the kidney has to, all right, take the drugs out of our body. In doing so, the drugs itself, it's not so much the pumping out. The drugs actually, and that's very often, right, medicines that we take can have an effect on the organs that we have. So making use of too, having too many painkillers, too long or overdosing, using a lot. Very often sometimes when people have drug overdoses, right, it's their kidneys that go into failure and they die from that. Right, the third thing we look at is old age. As we get older, our nephrons no, don't work as much. Our nephrons can all right, deteriorate, they break, and certain things can happen in our kidneys just due to old age. And sometimes all right, the kidneys just stop due to the fact that we are getting older. Right, now the, first, the fourth one over here is, I don't know if any of you, all right, you need to sometimes be careful of swimming in water that's not flowing. Because what happens is, right, very often in water, it's stagnant water. There's a little parasite, right, and we call it bilharzia. But what this little parasite can do is it actually burrows through the walls of our blood vessels and goes into our kidney and can actually destroy, right, the lining and the function of the kidney. Not always. I'm, always, I'm talking here about worst case scenario. So don't worry about, oh, I went swimming in water, but there are symptoms. Sometimes the stomach gets quite extended. You don't feel well. And if, if, the, if you do have kidney issues, you will feel it. There'll be pain. There'll be your urine burning sensation. You will have these. These are just possible causes of why a kidney could fail. Okay, so now we have the scenario of somebody or an individual that goes into kidney failure. What are the options going to be? So one of the options could be this process called dialysis. Now what dialysis is, is if you have a look at the diagram over here, a machine is going to take over the role of the kidney. And, and it does exactly, well, almost exactly as what a kidney does. So basically what happens is they're going to need to filter your blood. So where your kidneys aren't able to filter it, this machine is going to do that. And I'm not going to go into great details of what it does, but basically your blood is going to be filtered through this machine. And the same way in which your tubules, all right, did the filtering, this machine is going to do exactly that. So it's going to have all this filtrate. You'll see it's called, okay, dialysate. So it's all this tissue fluid. And basically, again, what will happen is your body will keep all the things that it needs. But all those things like the urea, the ureic acid, all of those nitrogenous wastes, there will be a concentration gradient. And all the wastes are pumped out because that's what it does, that concentration gradient. It pumps out of this machine and they put it into like a waste disposal machine. And they constantly will pump in this fresh. So what happens is while you're lying there, right, the blood, obviously your blood will go out it, the machine will filter it and it will return back to normal. 
Now, when you look at this the dialysis, you need to think of what would the advantages be and what would the advantage, disadvantages be. Now, if you look at the process, obviously it's going to filter your body. So if your kidneys are in failure, it will, it's a process that you could all right, go to or if you are wealthy enough, can have a machine in your home that will do this for you. So basically, it will keep you alive. But let's think about it. Right, what would the disadvantages be? So guys, this usually takes up to three to four hours to do. So it takes a very long time. Now you need to think, imagine you're a working person. You need to earn a salary. This really long time, what could it do? Right, it's going to obviously take a lot of time where you should have been earning money. So maybe your job might not be as, right, not, they won't, not as nice. They might say to you, listen here, you might use your job because you're a lot of away a lot of time. Also, the machines are very expensive. Now, I can assure you that not all of our medical facilities are going to have it. And this obviously brings about, right, rich versus poor. In our country, that is a large thing about access. Right, who can get access to the machines if they're wealthy enough or they might have medical aid or access to these facilities? They might be able to all right, be on dialysis a little bit longer. Also, imagine if you have to travel by taxi after three to four hours, right? You've had this and you've got to travel to and from. It could get really expensive. Now, if I go back to this picture over here, guys, what they need to do when they put it into your arm is they're taking blood out of your body. And what happens is when blood goes out of the body, remember, it can coagulate, it can clot. So what they need to do is they need to put an anticoagulant, right? That is medicine that stops your blood from clotting. But that could also have other problems. So you could actually lead to more bleeding, etc. Right, and also what happens is you might have to limit what you eat because not all the water, etc., is going to be right taken away with these wastes. So when we look at the process of dialysis, um, it is a somewhat of a short-term right solution to the problem. But as I said to you, there are unfortunately ma many disadvantages. The next solution right, which would be far more ideal, is a kidney transplant. Now, that would mean that you get a kidney from somebody who has died, all right, or maybe one of your relatives, somebody who has a close blood association to you, might match it, and they're going to donate your kidney. Now, I want you to have a look at the diagram of the board, because a lot of us think that we take the kidneys out and we put new ones in. But I want you to have a look here. We don't do that. Unless it's really severe, we leave the ones in and we transplant the kidney, right? Here's the blood supply. Take, you see, we, when we take the kidney, we need all the blood and we need the ureter as well. So when we transplant it, we bypass these two and we put, so now we literally have got three kidneys in. Those are not working and we bypass the kidney and we kind of plug it in. Kidney transplants, again, donors. Who, where are we going to get a matching donor from? And there's a lot more patients that need a kidney transplant than there are donors that are willing to donate, right? Some religions, um, some traditional beliefs, right? Donation of organs is not, right? part of their belief system, which makes transplanting or an organ or receiving an organ not necessarily what they're going to need. As I said to you, transplanting the kidney is probably the most, the organ that is transplanted the most, but there's still a shortage. What lists do you go on? What is your health? How come you get to the top of the list, etc.? Maybe you are richer and you can pay for it, or even there's Lots of illegal ways. Lots of people pay, all right, to have their kidney removed and they get money. There's lots of 
illegal ways that we can go there. Okay, now the not so, all right, the not so um, bad ones. This is called a kidney stone. And basically what happens is, I want you to have a look at this diagram. The salts that we, all right, that are in the tubules, they actually form crystals and they block the kidney. These are examples of what the stone looks like. So where you should have a liquid, what happens is, and if you have a look at the causes, maybe you have too much calcium, cheese, right, or milk, that, those can all go into calcium salts. Maybe you don't drink enough water and your urine is very concentrated, or sometimes our body right, can have the wrong pH. We're either too acidic or too alkaline. And what happens is, all right, let me go over here, these get stuck in there and we need to get them out because they cause a great deal of pain. I know I've had kidney stones three times. It was the most painful thing I have ever experienced. And usually what happens is that you pass them, okay? So you, you, have, you have a bit of infection because it stops the urine and your kidneys can swell and you feel like you want to urinate but you can't because nothing's coming out and you're in a great deal of pain. So generally what they'll do is they'll get you to pass it, or if you don't pass it, they can kind of like give little bursts, right, of, re of like little, like a light, and it breaks it up into smaller pieces. Not ideal. Drink your water, right, really, really good for you to have the water. All right, guys, that is it for excretion. I'm afraid we, time has run out. We've come to the end of our series on excretion. I hope you learned a lot. Until next time, cherry bye.